The best technology in the world is useless unless you have the right people who know how to use this stuff. And that has been a trend and a theme inside of Mighty Hive's growth from the very beginning. So just a little bit of background. Um, I'm the CEO of Mighty Hive. We were founded about seven years ago. We're one of the fastest growing programmatic media consultancies in the world. And um, we've been known very recently for doing a lot of very high profile in-housing uh, for Fortune 500 clients around the world. Um, I can tell you right now that we are working with some of the largest and most sophisticated advertisers to bring their stuff in-house. It is going very, very well across the board. But that's not what I want to talk to you guys about today. I started my career in, not in programmatic media, but instead in programmatic creative or dynamic creative or advanced creative. And in 2007, 12 years ago, when I started in this crazy business of ours, uh, I was an advanced, sorry, a product manager in the advanced advertising group at Yahoo. And I ran what was called the Smart Ads program. And I was thrilled with how amazing that technology was. And so sometimes when I'm out uh, talking to folks and giving speeches to uh, general audiences, I'll talk about the fact that, hey, you guys know those ads where you look at the red shoes? and you don't buy them, but they follow you around for a couple of months, for that I humbly apologize. It is, uh, you know. But what's interesting is that um, though Dynamic Creative has been around for quite a while, it's only been recently that on the services side, something has started to happen that was predicted quite a while ago, which is that we see people starting to merge media and creative. All the big holding companies are doing it. My firm, S4 Capital, is doing it. And it's interesting that you see all this, and we're gonna talk about why. What is happening? What has changed? What are the gotchas? How do you do this? Why is this necessary? So, first, a little more background. Um, I've been sp I spent the last 17 weeks of my life chasing a knight of the British Empire around the world. He is um, truly a formidable person. And he's right now uh, with my colleague, who was supposed to be up on stage with me down in LA having some ungodly important meeting and things like that. But um, just as a background, you know, Media Monks is the creative aspect of S4 Capital, and Mighty Hive is the media aspect of S4 Capital, and things are going very, very well. So, I want to tell you guys a story about the process that happened as we selected S4 Capital. And I promise you, it actually does relate to the topic at hand. So in like October uh, of last year, September of last year, we were trying to figure out of the 30 different companies that were trying to uh, have expressed interest in partnering with Mighty Hive, which one were we going to go with? And obviously, you know, S4 Capital was one, the one that we selected and was in the final group. And so it was very interesting that during the due diligence process, when we're trying to figure out exactly who we're going to go after, a legend in the industry, Jeff Goodby, whom, if you guys don't know, is one of the most celebrated and awarded creative directors in history. Goodby Silverstein, he's probably best known for his work on a campaign that I'm sure all of you know, Got Milk. And so, you know, when an industry legend like that says, Dear Martin Sorrell, your no creative model shouldn't happen and it won't, you might think that I'd be concerned, and indeed I was. I wanted to know what was happening here, what was going on, and um, if this meant that I probably shouldn't go with S4. In his editorial, which is online and published, you can see it today, he said, Not only your no creative model shouldn't happen and it won't, Target, yell, repeat, basically it's a commitment to tasteless insistence. I will say this, I went to Victor Knapp and Wesley Terhar and Sir Martin and I said, what's going on here? Right? I thought you guys were the future of creative and one of the industry legends is saying that you're not. As a matter of fact, he's saying that you're totally wrong. And I think that the conversation that we had right after that was the principal reason why we decided that S4 Capital was indeed the right place to go. And here's what happened. All respect 
to a man who has done amazing things and has had some of the most iconic creative campaigns in history. In this particular case, I think he's a little mistaken. Because what we believe is that this stuff, well, here's the things that haven't changed. You still, if you have a brand and you have a target user, you still have to have the big idea. You have to have the production teams actually create and execute that big idea. You have to buy the media in order to place that big idea in front of people, and then you have to analyze it and you have to lather, rinse, repeat. That hasn't changed, has not changed. But the actual motions of what happens inside of it has changed a lot. And we believe that technology doesn't debase creativity. If used correctly, it elevates it. Because we are all really different people. Every single person in the room has slightly different tastes or maybe even wildly different tastes from each other. And that's why personalization is necessary. In the old world, when you had limitations in media, where literally you had to broadly cast one single message to everybody, then yes, it was not possible to actually personalize this creative. But in today's world, it is possible. And what we're talking about is using technology to actually deliver that age-old and sometimes tired old statement, the right message at the right time to the right person. We've been talking about this for not 12 years, but 25 years, and we're finally on the cusp of actually doing it. We believe that technology and the services teams are going to be unleashing creativity at scale. The pace of change is accelerating. I think you guys all know this. I won't belabor this slide, but all this slide really says is that some things, uh, technologies that come out today rapidly proliferate throughout the entire world. One of the ways that we know this is that consumers now expect relevance, and that's because of the changes in media technology. I've said this on this stage before, I'll say it again. We live in an unprecedented time of media. For the first time in history, consumers, every single one of you, me too, can watch anything you want, read anything you want, listen to anything you want, perfectly synchronized across every connected device that you own. Full stop. That means your media streams are better, more enjoyable than ever before. And unfortunately for the advertisers, that expectation for perfection, for meaning, for relevance, also applies to the ads. People get mad when you interrupt their perfectly curated media streams with ads that don't make sense. And this is why there has never been a point in time where consumer sentiment around advertising is lower. Not because we got worse at it, but because the bar went up in terms of the quality that people expect. So against that backdrop, we need to have cross-screen, on-demand, personalized everywhere, perfect messages that at least try to compete and keep up with the media streams in terms of quality. It's no longer one size fits all. It's many sizes for many people. You need to have all of your ads perfectly synchronized to a person because that's the way the media comes. What's interesting about the creative technologies today, and you know, I think you guys just sat through Joanna's uh, explanation of what dynamic creative technology and creative management platforms and things like that do, so I'm not going to actually uh, go through that again. Needless to say, the summary is you can have billions of versions of a creative if you want to, which in a way means that you are expanding the advertiser's vocabulary so that they can have a conversation with each one of you individually. What's interesting about this is that even Mr. Goodby himself recognized this. In the background of this slide, you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times three, 24 different iterations of the Got Milk campaign. It was iconic. Everybody has seen these. It took 20 years to iterate through all the different white mustaches of these types of things. And with due respect to Mr. Goodby, we're not trying to kill creativity, we're trying to unleash it. We're trying to say that his iconic campaign, which he himself 
put out 24 different iterations of, over 20, or you know, many, many iterations of, 24 of which you see here, over 20 years. We want to take that, not in 20 years, not in 20 weeks, maybe 20 days or 20 hours. Faster, better, cheaper. Not killing the creativity, but unleashing it. Making sure that every single one of you sees the perfect version of this ad. And that's what we're trying to do. I've been thinking about this a long, long time. This is a blog post, still available online if you'd like to go, petekim.com, that I wrote in April of 2010. And it's called The Curse of Vanilla. In it, I talk about the experiences of a very young product manager who had no idea what he was doing as he was trying to put dynamic creative technology out into the world. For those of you who um, you know, will bear with me with a little bit of statistical background, I think here's a problem inside of dynamic creative. If you create a billion different variations of an ad or 10 billion uh, variations of an ad or 100 billion variations, variations of an ad, the more variations you have, the longer it takes to figure out which one is perfect for every individual. Make sense? There's just lots of options to check. And so one of the dangers when you're putting out dynamic creative technology is that you want to make sure that people don't go buck wild and create hundreds of billions of variations of minor, minor differences. You want to keep it smaller so that the media and the testing can converge upon the answers within this, the life of a single campaign. Make sense? So. I was out there and I was saying, hey, creative agencies, you know, when you're using this amazing technology, don't go crazy and don't use, you know, 100 billion variations. And I was so damn wrong. Because the danger was never that they'd use the technology too much. The danger was that they'd ignore it completely. Making minor variations of the single creative that they have been used to pumping out for decades. The muscle memory that the creative industry has had, the stricture that they had, the restriction that they had of having one message for everybody because of television, because of newspapers, because of magazines, is what was the real danger, and I missed that. It is now very clear to me that what I should have said to these folks was the following. All of you pretend you are creative directors. And I would come in and I'm um, saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to bring out a brand new technology that will change the way that you guys think about creative and make sure that your creative lands with personalized genius to every single person in this world. How many of you, Mr. C Mr. and Mrs. Creative Directors of the world, have spent time arguing amongst yourself about which is the perfect idea for the ad. Should it be white mustaches or should it be something else? Jockeying back and forth around what is the sort of central theme for the next campaign that's gonna change the world. And you would all say, that's what we do. We constantly debate which is the right creative theme to kind of go for. What is the right spirit? And, and you know what? That's great but you don't have to do that anymore. You're all very talented creative directors. You all know your audience very well, and the chances are you're all partly right. It's just that each of you were trying to appeal to a different demographic, to a different person, to a different situation. And in a world where you can only have one idea that wins, you must do this gladiatorial combat in order to figure out whose idea is going to be the one that actually gets produced. You don't have to do that anymore. Produce them all. Put them all out there in millions of iterations or whatever, and the technology will then go out there and figure out which one should go to whom in real time. That's what I should have said back then, and finally, Nine years later, it seems that we are on the cusp of that. That being said, the cusp means that we are in early days. I've been waiting nine years. I can wait more if necessary. But we are in the early days of this. 
Joanna talked about the different types of creative technologies that are out there right now. Finally, this is happening. But I think that the other things that is going to be interesting for every single person here is that, as I'll return to my point from earlier, which is that the best technologies in the world don't do anything unless they have the right people who are using those tools. We need to change our mindset from sequential messaging to a narrative story arc, from dynamic creative to thinking about these tools as a way to get our story across. We are not doing these big, gigantic campaigns anymore that happen once or twice a year. Instead, we are having constant conversations with each and every consumer in the world in real time. It is hard enough for most of us to have one conversation at once. Imagine trying to have a billion simultaneously. That's what this is going to do. We need to get rid of jargon like first party data and just actually acknowledge this is what we know about our customer and then we need to use it. Analytics, dressing these things up in fancy terms, what's effective, what's not, did this land, do we have the right messages that are out there? And it must be integrated with media. You cannot do this if you are updating your campaigns four or five times a year. Simply cannot. It's like having a conversation with somebody who always says the wrong thing and takes an incredibly long time, months, before they respond to what you just said. You have to go so much faster and that's what is driving the combination in terms of the services of the media and the creative teams. By the way, this is also what's driving the motion towards increasing control within housing. All of these things are in the pursuit of being able, as an advertiser, to have that conversation with the clients, with the consumers, across every touch point. And by the way, I'm not just talking about the advertising. I'm talking about each in-person interaction. I'm talking about each e-commerce transaction. I'm talking about every email. I'm talking about every single conversation on the phone. All of these together form a conversation across multiple different channels which all have to be optimized in real time and every single time you say something else, everything else that happened in the past must be taken into consideration. What I'm talking about is a sweeping change of massive proportions. And it is the only way that we're going to keep up with the consumers who expect us to be better than yell, spray, pray. Ironically, in my opinion, Mr. Goodby is probably the one that needs to think about what exactly he was pushing. There are challenges ahead. Attribution. You cannot improve what you cannot measure. CTR, engagement, et cetera, et cetera. All of these have been largely debunked as genuine performance metrics. We care about ROI. That is the nature and that is the purpose of any commercial activity, including advertising. If we can't measure how much someone bought because we showed them this ad, if we cannot prove that that economic impact was bigger than the actual outlay and costs, then the entire thing was a business failure, full stop. We need to figure out how to measure this stuff better. Resistance to change. Look, I've been waiting nine years for some of this stuff to happen, and it's finally starting to happen. It's not just because the technology was complicated. As a matter of fact, the technology, in many cases, was already there nine years ago. It's the people that are the true stumbling blocks sometimes. The politics around change can be brutal. The resistance to change can be intimidating. The short-term thinking of, I don't want to do this because it's hard, is frustrating. And yet, change is constant. Despite the fact that it's difficult for us as an industry to keep up with the consumers, I guarantee you one thing, 
They're not going to stop and wait. They're going to continue to change. As a matter of fact, as the graph showed earlier, they're going to accelerate that change. And they are sprinting away from us. So despite the fact that we need to figure out how to measure this stuff, the fight, despite the fact that it's hard to change, that change is going to relentlessly continue. As a matter of fact, it's going to accelerate, and we need to keep up. Here are the things that we need to do together. First and foremost, we need to embrace the idea of creative at scale. Not one get milk ad and then, you know, 5, 10, 20 more versions over 20 years. Thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of variations right out of the gate planned for from the beginning. By the way, this specific skill is exactly why I went with MediaMonks and S4, because they were the first creative people that I've ever met that truly understood that. I've been waiting for them for a long time. It's a journey, not a touch point, and we need to reunite media and creative. I've already told you why. Because, but here it is, just as a sound bite. In the world that we used to live in, maybe media and creative had to collaborate with each other four times a year. Hey, we're doing our quarterly creative refresh. Let's have a meeting and let's talk about it. Great. If you have, if you only need to collaborate four times a year, fine. You can be in separate teams. If you're going to collaborate four times an hour, you better be in the same damn room. And that is partially why media and creative need to be reunited together, because now it is a real-time team that needs to go after this stuff.